and talk about the offering appeal. You see these envelopes before you, and inside each envelope, it kind of tells you an outline how you can give offerings. Used to, in our um, tithe offerings on um, envelopes on the back, it would talk about 10 plus 10. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Del Walters, associate professor of um, Southern Adventist University, tells this story. As a small child, I was taught to tithe. Tithing was never a question in my mind. My parents gave me offerings to give for Sabbath school, and I put them in the offering plate. During my academy and early college years, I was impressed that I needed to give offerings. But I wasn't sure how to go about figuring out what I should do. Paying my own academy and college tuition was a heavy burden. But God provided a good job, and I earned enough. One year, I found out that I was going to get a small raise. I thought, I'm living just fine, fine on what I'm making now. <clears throat> I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to give 2% of my gross income for offerings, and I won't miss it at all. So that's what I did. From then on, when I got a raise, <clears throat> I would add a percent or two to my offerings. By the time I finished college, I was paying 10% tithe, 5% church budget, 3% world budget, and 2% conference adv advance. I finished college debt-free, that's a, that's a task in itself, and with several thousand dollars in the bank. So I say amen to that. I have continued this plan my whole life, even though at times money seemed tight while we raised our family. God has truly, sorry, God has truly blessed just as he said he would. So today's offering is for the world budget and annual sacrifice. May the deacons stand. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, and when we love you, we want to return to you everything that you have given to us. Lord, you only require a tenth for yours, and the other comes from our, where we prosper. Thank you so much, dear Lord, that you look after us each and every day, each and every week, and every year after year. And Lord, whatever we have, Lord, we want to willingly give it to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
It's story time. Thank you. Very nice, Gabby. Story time. Time to pick up the offering from the saints' time. Time for Uncle Lewis to share with you this morning. I imagine it's going to be very good. So, boys and girls, get your shoes back on and come down the store, the aisle because uh, I'm going to tell a little story first. <laughs> when I was a boy going to Sabbath school, come on, boys and girls, where are you? Can't see you. The dollar bills are waving. I was in Hawaii. We did not wear shoes all week long. So uh, it was a trial to wear them to church. By church time, the trial was too much, and you could look under the pews and you'd see, Wherever children were sitting, there was a row of shoes. So um, I don't think with the weather today we'd do that. Okay. Good morning, boys and girls. While we're finishing up, I'm going to go ahead and start my story because we got a lot going on today. I'm going to tell you a story this morning about a horse. If you'll look at the picture, this is a, this is a horse, and his name is Peanut. Peanut became a part of our family about 10 years ago. He was eight years old. We got him from a family in Iowa who had uh, was a horse trainer. And um, he, uh, he uh, had been trained to do some things. And uh, we bought him for our son, who was rodeoing at the time. But Peanut is now 18. And so this is what Peanut looked like eight years ago. You know, he became a part of our family. And every day we've taken care of him, and Benjamin has ridden him and, and uh, trained. He, he and Peanut both have learned a lot of things together. And um, this is a picture of Peanut uh, in competition. He's got his saddle on him, and he's ready to go. But, you know, Peanut has some special skills, but it took a lot of time to learn those special skills. And, you know, have you ever seen a horse in the summer when a fly lands on him and they can just, they can just feel that fly? Well, I'm going to tell you, when you put a saddle on a horse, they feel everything. When that, when that uh, cowboy steps into that saddle, they feel every muscle twitch. They have that bridle in their mouth. They feel every movement. And so they have to become partners, and it takes a lot of time to do that. And so when you learn to do things, <clears throat> you learn to do uh, um, in competition, you learn to to rope cattle, and this is called tie-down calf roping. It was kind of taken away, taken from the when the, the, the cowboys used to gather the cattle up and to, to give them medication and to brand them and so forth. And um, this was Peanut when he was, was younger. And this is a, a, a short video of Peanut about a month ago, and the same cowboy is still riding Peanut. So Peanut has been a part of our family for a long time, and this is how he still performs at age 18. He's 18 years old now, and this is, you watch the horse, because the horse still knows what to do, he does everything he needs to do, and he knows exactly what's going on. You know, <clears throat> we all have things happen in our life for a reason, and <clears throat> life is about choices. Life is about choices. And, you know, there is a, there's a choice that we can make as boys and girls and men and women that, that we can have a partner in our life every day and in everything that we do. And so that partner's name is Jesus. But we have to spend time, in, time with them to make them a part of our family. And we spend time by reading Scripture and putting uh, the knowledge and the time that we can no, and Jesus knows how we feel, and he's lived this life with us. And so he kind of knows he, want, we, he wants to be a partner with you, just like Peanut was a partner with Benjamin. So it, if you look in all four of the Gospels, there's this, this um, uh, account where Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And here's the kicker. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter into it. So what does that tell us? That tells us in order for us to get the rewards of spending time 
making him a part of us, putting Jesus in our heart, then we can, we can have that very uh, reward of the sacrifice that Jesus spent on the cross for each and every one of us. So remember, let's put Jesus in our heart, spend that time and make him a part of your family. You may go back to your seats. Thank you, Dr. Cox, the blessing. Thank you, children, for your part. We're reading scripture this morning in Joshua 21. How many have enjoyed Pastor's series on Joshua? Let me see your hands. I know I have. I wouldn't have believed there would be so many wonderful lessons in Joshua. So we continue again today. We're reading uh, 21 verses 43 to 45, and I'm reading in the King James Version. And the Lord gave unto Israel all the land which he sware to give unto their fathers. And they possessed it and dwelt therein. And the Lord gave them rest round about according to all that he sware unto their fathers. And there stood not a man of all their enemies before them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. There failed not aught, that means nothing, of any good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel. All came to pass. Amen. Amen and amen. And as it's been in the past, it will be in the future. And we stand on the sea of glass, the last enemy vanquished. What's the last enemy, by the way? What's the last enemy? Death. Amen. The last enemy will be vanquished. We will stand there and we will say, every word you promise, all the promises, they're all true. They're all true. We're having our prayer this morning, and uh, we have a garden of prayer. If you have a special request, a special praise, please come down and join us. And if you have a written request, we'll take in our Bible and we'll pray over it during the week. Thank you. Wonderful Heavenly Father, we are bowed before you today, your children, your children needy, your children sometimes disobedient, but Lord, we're here. We're here to say we're sorry we've hurt you this week. Please forgive us. Please change our hearts. Make your word powerful in our lives. We're also here to Thank you for, for so many blessings which are only a token of the true blessing of your presence, of your joy, your peace, your forgiveness in our lives and the changing that you are bringing about as we prepare for heaven. We want you to come soon. Many things on our heart today, Lord. We have illness issues. We have... Um, family problems, uh, we have financial needs, etc., etc. You know about them all. And we're here to tell you that we believe 
your promise to take care of those needs. Above all, to bless us with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for Laura and her commitment to you today. Thank you for the precious little one that is being dedicated today to you. Lord, thank you for being here for each one of us, each one of us. Bless your church. Oh, Father, the enemy is coming in like a flood, but you have promised to raise up a standard against the enemy, and we're claiming that promise today. We're claiming it. We believe in it. Thank you. Thank you. May each one here know that he or she is your special child you love very, very much. And as we hear from your word today, may that be reinforced. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. And in our prayers, uh, because the world's still out there in the world, uh, the leader of this world, he wants to pull us down, but Jesus wants to keep us strong and ready for heaven. So, Lord, because of your testimony of wanting to give your life to Jesus and wanting to serve him and be faithful until he comes to take you home, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.
really nice to have these young people come and lead out in our worship services. Uh, here for a few moments, uh, we're going to have a little one come and lead out. Is that all right? Uh, Ed and Marceline and uh, Maxim, can, can you guys bring little Eddie Mike down? He's got a name much longer than that. Much, much longer than that. Some of you haven't seen little Eddie Mike yet. He's a pretty good little package. He was born just a couple weeks ago at nine pounds and two ounces. So he's, he's almost all there. Yeah, it's almost all. See all that hair? He's over 10 now. Some of you hadn't met uh, Ed. Ed is a Christian in another faith, but he's coming here today to have his son, Eddie Mike, uh, dedicated to the Lord. And, of course, you know Marceline and you know Maxim, and uh, now you know Eddie Mike. And, you know, history tells us that, that people used to take their child to the synagogue or to the temple to be blessed by the priest and dedicated to the Lord. And, you know, we know that Joseph and Mary took their little baby Jesus to the temple and, and Simeon was there and he held the baby in his arms and he looked at it and he thanked the Lord for letting his eyes see the Messiah before he died. And so uh, Simeon blessed that little baby Jesus and I know you want the same blessing for for Eddie Mike. Now, Edward means he's, he's appointed as a protector of others. And Michael means he is reflecting the spiritual truthfulness of God. So it will be up to you as his mom and then dad and as uncle now to make sure that as he grows up, that he will have these characteristics in his life that you have named him for. And as, as the Bible says, uh, God is able to do these things. And he is able not only to give you a son, but to also help you raise that son to know the Lord. And uh, you can have some help doing that if you want to. If you look out here, there are a lot of people here that I'm going to invite not to come to your house and babysit. No, that's important. But, but if you need them, there might be some that do that. But I'm going to invite the church family that they will remember little Eddie Pike in prayer and as you raise him in the Lord. And I'm also going to ask that you spend time in the Word of God, reading those verses about how to raise our children in the Lord so that they will grow up and that they will be faithful. Okay, now it's my turn, all right? Can I hold him? Will he let me? He don't bite yet, does he? Okay, let me go ahead and give this to you. That's a little certificate. Here we go. I'll probably make him cry. Look at that. Okay, he's a precious little guy. I can't hold him on the right hand. I'm a left-handed daddy. Okay, grandpa now. Yeah, that's for sure. Okay, let's, let's pray for you guys. Father in heaven, again, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to be here, to stand here with Ed and Marceline and, and Maxim and know that they are doing everything they can to give the love out of that they can to little Eddie Mike. But we, we hold him today and we ask that your guardian angel will protect him, that he will guide him, that he will grow up tall and strong. But also, Lord, we ask that you help him to grow up to be faithful to you. Help him to be the guardian of this faith and truthfulness and to share the love of Jesus Christ with those around him. Lord, we give him to you. And so we thank you for giving him back to us to do all this work to train him in your ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He's got his eyes open. He's looking at you. See, we got to teach him to keep his eyes closed during prayer. I'm just, I'm just teasing, all right? Okay, y'all can go back. I'll keep him, all right? Okay, we, we, we got, we, I'll hold him here just for a second. We want to make sure that, no, give her the flowers. I'll hold the baby. Do I have anybody else that wants to hold this baby? Should, should we just pass him down the pew? 
precious, precious, precious. And there's some books that you can stay up when he stays awake at night like he is. You got something to read him now. All right. All right. There you go. You can have him back. All right. Thank you. God bless. Okay, got a couple of other things to do. This this morning is another special Sabbath. Tomorrow is really the special day. But we would like to at least say thank you to the veterans who are attending our worship service today. So if, if you are a veteran in any department of the armed services, can you just stand where you are? Can you do that? Stand where you are. Okay. All right, look at this. All right, Let, let's start right here and just just tell us what department you're in. T, Air Force, Air Force. Ed, Army, Navy. Navy. Right here, guys. <laughs> Marines, Air Force and Army. Way back there, Army. Army right here, Army, Army. Army. U.S. Navy. US Navy. Charlie. Air Force, Army, who else? You didn't stand. <laughs> okay, and I was in the Army. That's why I wore my tie today, you know, in honor of you guys and all the others, and you know, appreciate what you've done. And, uh, you know, I'll meet you at IHOP for breakfast about 6 o'clock in the morning. It's free there. Just giving you, if you don't already know. Okay. Uh, then I'd like to just spend just a little bit more time with Laura. Laura, can I meet you down front here? Okay. Like to, like to go ahead and give you your baptismal certificate. Will, we might need you here too. We might need your, your strong arms, Okay. But anyway, I'd like, like to give you your baptismal certificate and a Bible. I know you have one that you use, but we're going to give another. In case you're given a Bible study, you will have another Bible to share, all right? But we'd like you to have that and hope that you uh, stay nice and strong. Ed, Ed and, and Soreen also has some gifts for you. One is a book on what do we as Seventh-day Adventists believe. And uh, the other is a book on Jesus Christ and helping us to know him better. And then there's some ladies out here that they, they're going to, you know, they're going to need uh, your help to, they've got some gifts that they want to come and just fill your arms up with. Oh, that's for me? All right. You didn't know you were so handy being a friend, did you? Yeah, okay. I might, I might just add while they're, where they're sharing their, their gifts of love with her that uh, our church is a church that we do our best to walk with Jesus. Uh, sometimes the world gets under our skin and we just can't help ourselves any way we say we can't. And, uh, you know, but I'd like to, as, as Laura has, has given her heart to Jesus, I'd like to invite you, if you want to know the Bible better, if you want to know Jesus better, and you'd like to study and find out if Jesus can be a part of your life until he comes again, let me know and we'll have some Bible studies together or I'll send you over to Bissell's house <laughs> or somebody else's house that you, you can con make contact with. And, and so uh, be sure and contact me and we'll do what we can to make sure you stay strong in the Lord, okay? All right, enjoy some flowers. And uh, if you, if you want to sit down and be the, the freshest smelling person, that, that's mine. They gave that to me. But if you'll hold oh, that for me till I, get, till I get through preaching, okay? All right, thank you so much. You. God bless. It is working. Look at that. After sitting still for so long, sometimes these computers go to sleep, don't they? Uh, 
It's been a busy Sabbath, and it's almost time for me to have the closing prayer. Uh, is anyone too cold? Okay, if you're too cold, can you go sit between two people that are too hot? Is anyone in here too hot? Okay, there's a few of you. We had the temperature just right, and then everybody came in all at once, and you brought your own little BTU body in here, and it got warm fast, and uh, we shouldn't tell you, but we did turn the air conditioner on. So uh, it needs it everywhere but in the mother's room. The mother's room was cold this morning. Well, there was a well-known Christian author. He was riding in the airplane, sitting on one of the exit seats, and as as people were coming in, there was a, a tall gentleman walking down the aisle and called this Christian Arthur by name. And he stopped and talked to him for just a little while, but with everyone trying to load the plane, he had to hurry on back to where his seat was. And uh, the author gathered that this man, tall and stately, at about 50-something years old, had, had a, in their conversation, he had gathered that this man had attended one of his seminars sometime before and had really enjoyed it and even purchased one of the books that the author had had written in, and he had really enjoyed that too. And, and uh, about an hour later, in the middle of the flight, uh, all of a sudden, this author, he, he felt a tap on his shoulder. And he looked up, and this tall, stately man was handing him a napkin that the, the stewardess had given along with their cold drinks. And on the back of that napkin, he had written a note. And so I want to share some of this note with you this morning. He said, Six summers ago, my wife and I had to bury our 24-year-old daughter. This came about because we were at the lake and there was an accident at the lake. And then my daughter was on life support for two weeks and we didn't see it coming. And he said, how do you go on vacation with your family with four people and come back with three? How do you do it? You know, <laughs> they made it to their house and some friends came over. Some of one of the friends uh, had had to bury one of their children in the past. And uh, there was another old lawyer came by and he gave them a kind of encouraging message. He says, I want you to know, God does not mean anything but good to you. No harm at all. No harm at all. Here the family had, had prayed for a miracle, a miracle that their daughter would come back to life, a miracle that the smile would be put back on her face and, re, and she would be restored. But here they were having to unplug their daughter from life support, and it was very, very hard. And the decision was very painful for them to do, but... These parents came to a place where they were very confident that they were doing the right play thing. They knew that God knew their pain. Okay, God's work may not be, his best work may not have been in restoring their daughter to life. They said, God's best work was in helping my wife and I to get through it. Much harder for God to do that. And how can we, going through all these things, know that God really knows what's best? But the parents had come to the place where they realized that God knows that our daughter is ready to go. She's ready. And so knowing that helped them to get through these things. And, and when I heard this story, I wanted to know, how does it happen? How does it happen that a husband and wife can bury their daughter and believe that God meant him good and not harm? How do they do that? You know, that, that little napkin that he wrote on could have, have borne a much different message. It could have said that I am angry and I am bitter and I'm full of hurt and hate inside. I'm so disappointed. I'm full of despair. I don't like God at all. So what was it that 
made the difference. What was it? I believe that these grieving parents had come to a place where they could believe in God's promise that faith is a choice, a choice. And they determined to stand up. They came to those crossroads of belief on this side and unbelief on the other side. And they were forced to choose to believe or to choose not to believe. And they determined every day that they would place one foot in front of the other on the pathway to faith. And as hard as they try, sometimes all they can do is just kind of trudge along. Sometimes all they can do is to limp through life because they missed her so much. And all they could do now is to make a conscious step towards God, knowing that they could lean on the promises of God. Well, Joshua's story, as we've been studying, I believe Joshua's story urges us to do the same thing. In fact, one might argue that the central message of the book of Joshua is that God keeps his promises and you and I can trust him because he keeps all of his prophecies, pro promises. If you, if you want to read again with me our scripture passage, it says, So the Lord gave Israel all the land in which he had sworn to give their fathers, and they took possession of it, and they dwelt in it. And the Lord gave them rest from all around, according to all that he had sworn to their fathers. And not a man of their enemies stood against them. And not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken of the house of Israel. All of it came to pass. These three verses are the theological heart of the book of Joshua. And Joshua kind of pounds his his thoughts in, in triplicate there. He says three times in three verses, he declares God did what he said he would do. And if you look at it, if you look at it there in verse 43, the Lord gave Israel all that he had sworn to give their, their, their fathers. And in verse 44, the Lord gave rest to all that he had sworn to their fathers. And in verse 45, not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken. All of it came to pass. We live in a world that is full of failing words, don't we? Full of it. Broken promises, empty vows, pledges made only to be reacted or to be retracted and assurances that are given to us and then they are ignored but you never hear them from God not at all in a world of failing words his words remain in a life full of broken promises God comes along and he gives us these promises and he keeps them in fact in Psalms 12 and verse 6 the Lord's promise is sure he speaks no careless word. All he says is purest truth like silver seven times refined. Do you have any silver that's like that? Seven times it is refined. And he says, my promise is sure. And God is a covenant-keeping God. He's a God who knows how to give a promise and to follow through with his, his promise. If you want proof, you can go to Joshua's story here in verse 43. The Lord gave to Israel all of the land that he had sworn to give to their fathers. You know, God had promised Abraham that many, many years before. He, and then the Lord appeared to Abraham and he said, To your descendants I will give this land. That was about 600 years before. And who believed that it would happen? When, when Abraham had died, he owned only that one piece of property. And on that piece of property, that was where he, he had a cemetery plot for his wife, Sarah. But then he died and he was buried there. And then his descendants. And finally, his descendants became slaves. And for four centuries, they lived over there in Egypt until Moses came by and took them out of the, prom, out of the, the land of Egypt and brought them them over towards the promised land but even he did not lead them into the land of Canaan how many times had the descendants of Abraham who knew who they were looked up into those stars in the sky and answered uh, and, and prayed to God God will you keep your promises 
Will you give us this land that you told our grandfather who was great, great, great grandfather? And we see the answer here in the pages of Joshua. God promises Abraham in Genesis. God says, I will bless you and I will make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And this promise was partially fulfilled during the time of Joshua when it was totally fulfilled during the life of Jesus because in him all nations have become blessed. In Jesus, every person on the face of this earth has the possibility of redemption. And that's why Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20, all the promises of God find their what? Yes. In him. I like that verse, don't you? I saw it in several verses, and all of them translated all the promise of God find their yes in Jesus. Our God is a promise keeping God. And if God makes a promise, he says that he will keep it. He says, He who promised is faithful in doing this. Does it matter? Because does God's integrity make a difference today? When your daughter is on life support, when she's laying there in that bed, and you are out in the hall and you're pacing the hallway of the hospital, does it make a difference if God is faithful or not? It does. When you're wondering what to do during a patient's worst nightmare, you have to choose either faith or fear or God's purpose or random history. Well, this is where we are, folks. No. God who knows and a God who cares. We all make choices, don't we? We just need to have a solid choice that we can make, and we can make that on the word of Jesus Christ. People who lived in the promised land chose to believe in the God of the promised land. And they chose to believe that God is up to something good even though we see things around us not looking good. And they echo the verse of that old hymn entitled The Solid Rock, His oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. We sing this song often. Nothing deserves your attention more than God's promises and nothing will ever sustain you like the promises of God. Some of these promises that we read in Scripture, if something happens and you are bereaved, you can turn to Psalms 30 and verse 5. It says, Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Does that sound good? Wow. Or to those who are besieged, it says, The righteous person may have troubles, but the Lord delivers them from them all. And to those who are sick, I just shared this with someone just the other day, the Lord sustains them on their sick bed and restores them from their bed of illness. And to those who are lonely, when you do pass through the waters, he says what? I will be with you. He says these things. To those who are dying, we need to remind them that in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not, Saul would have told you. He says, I do what? I go to prepare a place for you. And to the rest of us, oh, to us sinners, all right? He says, my grace is sufficient for you. Promises that are good for you, Peter tells us, and because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. You know, what what do you do when when a fear begins to surface? What do you do? Well, I would encourage you. Respond with the thought, but but God says in his word. And what do you do when all of a sudden doubts arise? You go to the word of God and you find out, but God says. And what do you do when guilt overwhelms you? You go back and you say, but God says. 
And you and I can turn to these spoken covenants that God has made, and we can search these scriptures kind of like a miner who's out there looking for gold, and when all of a sudden he looks down, he finds one of those nuggets. He says, I can trust it, and I can take this nugget to the bank, right? That's what we can do as we study God's Word. I have a friend who was flying around the country, and he had a stopover in, in, or he was going home to San Antonio, and he was flying from one place through Houston to San Antonio. And because of bad weather, his flight was delayed. And uh, they they landed the plane on the tarmac there in Houston at the exact time that his plane was supposed to be leaving from Houston to San Antonio. And so as they were taxiing over to the airport there, uh, he checked his watch and he, he thought about turning his phone off of silent and uh, calling his wife and saying, I'm not going to be home till later. And then he started kind of scrolling through there trying to find out, well, is there, uh, is there a hotel nearby <laughs> that I could get a room? But then while he was thinking about all these things, all of a sudden over the loudspeaker, there was a voice that was heard. And it said, this is the pilot. Okay? This is the pilot. I know that many of you have more connections, but relax. You're going to make them because I've called ahead. They're holding your planes for you because we have a place for you. And my friend thought for a while, well, you know, he wouldn't say that just to pull our leg, would he? He wouldn't say that just to, and not mean it. And so he himself decided to put his trust in the pilot and he put his phone back by his side and he didn't call his wife. He didn't call the hotel. Instead, he began to relax and he got up in an orderly fashion. He didn't try to rush off the plane. Everybody deplaned and went down the road, and he set his sights on finding the next gate, and he, he marched all the way through that concourse with confidence because his pilot had given him a promise, had he not? But you know, there, there were other people in the airport that day who were a little more frustrated than that. They weren't so fortunate. They were, they were also victims of all the weather that was going on out there in the sky around the airport. And they, they were seen to have panic written all over their face. And they were scrambling and they were worried that they weren't going to get to their flight or their connecting flight. You know, that was too bad. Because hadn't their pilot spoken to them and... If their pilot had spoken to them, did they not believe what he said? Hmm. Friends, I want you to know that your pilot and mine has spoken to you right here in this book. In this book. He's spoken to us. Will you listen? Will you listen? Will you take the time to read it and when you read it, will you read it enough to let his promises settle over you? And when everyone and everything around you is all in panic, that you choose instead to live a life of peace because he has promised it to you? You know, I have a friend, we're going to call him Bob. Bob had a quick smile, he had a, had a very nice handshake, and, and he loved to laugh, he loved to play jokes on people and to eat ice cream, and for 30 years he held the same job, and he, he uh, was buried to the same wife, and he served the same church, and he was well known all over town where he lived and did business. He, he raised his children along with some other foster children and never missed a day work until one day he was diagnosed with brain cancer. And his family and his friends, they began to pray for him, and they asked God to remove this cancer. And for a time, it appeared that they had. But then the symptoms began to return with a vengeance. And uh, in a matter of weeks, he was immobilized, and at home he was put under hospice care. And his children kind of moved back into the house with mom and, 
And they each one took their time, their little vigil there with dad throughout the night so that mom could get some rest. And to make their life a little easier when he was sleeping, they put a baby monitor in there in his rooms and then they could see what he was doing without opening up the door and interrupting him. And although he had hardly spoken in several days, they wanted to hear him if he was able to call out. And, and one night in the, in the middle of the night, he, he called out for help. But he didn't call out for them. He called out to Jesus. And the son heard his dad's voice in the other room. And his dad asked, he says, Jesus, I want to thank you for my life. And you've been good for me. And I just want you to know when you're ready to take me, I'm ready to go ready to go you know I want to have that kind of faith don't you I want to have the kind of faith that can turn to God in in earth's darkest hours and praise God even though my body may be weak I want my faith to always stay strong because faith is a choice isn't it it's a choice let us pray Father, we tell these stories and we relate to these stories. Maybe some of these things have happened to us or <clears throat> we know someone very close to us that it has happened to. And we can see once again that through the life of Joshua, he tells us that God always comes through with his promises. He knows what is best. He knows that it's for our good. And sometimes we refuse to listen to our God. Sometimes we refuse to listen to our pilot, our, the one who is guiding us. Sometimes we refuse to even read the word of God because we hurt so bad. But Lord, help us in a special way to remember the promises that you've given us. We know what happens. We know what the future holds as Seventh-day Adventists. We, we can share the prophecies of the Bible with other things, but sometimes these things come upon us and we begin to take it personal and we forget that you are still in control. So be with us, Lord. Thank you for making us aware again of these promises in Scripture and help us to not only put them in our hearts, but to put them in our minds and let us use them until you come to take us home. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite those who are leading the songs to come forward. And, and I might just add, and, and those of you who have uh, some of our church family has family and friends who have been a part of this big fire that's been out in California. And they've been pretty up to date, and you've seen things on the news and other things that are happening. But, but we need to do what we can to keep these people in mind. They, they've lost everything just in a short amount of time, and, and we're talking about you know, church family in another church. And so there, there might be something you could consider doing it. The one thing that I've heard on the internet is that maybe we could do something to help these people now financially because they have to find a motel room <laughs> or some place to live another place and maybe they don't have the finances to do that so think about that next sabbath we'll have some more information and and if you want to plan to give towards something like that whether it's the fires in california or some of these hurricanes that have happened on the east coast or in the gulf i'm sure that uh, there are people that can use our financial help I invite you to stand for our op uh, closing song, My Faith Looks Up to Thee, hymn number 517. Five seventeen, My Faith Looks Up to Thee.
said we would like to share some gifts with Ed and Marceline and Eddie Mike. Okay, you didn't know about this, but uh, after our service today, uh, if you can make your way towards the fellowship room down there, I think there's some gifts for little Eddie Mike. Is that all right? Okay. All right. That's all right. They said diapers, 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 diapers. I'm going to need them for a while, right? Okay, let's bow our heads as we pray. Again, Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to come to worship. There's always something that we can learn. There's always something the pastor needs to look at again to renew his experience with you. So I ask that you be with me, and I ask that you be with each person in our church family, that, that we will put a greater faith in you. One day you're going to come and take us home, and whether it's before you come in the clouds of glory and we're on our deathbed, Lord, we just ask that you help us to be faithful until you come and take your people home is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 